Hello everyone and welcome back to The Beatles Forever. Today we're going to delve once more into The Love You Make story by Peter Brown and see what happens next after the breakup of The Beatles. And this time it's going by individuals of The Beatles and we'll find out what their lives were like once they disbanded. So I'm going to do uh, George, Ringo, and Paul today. And then lastly, the last video of the series is going to be John Lennon because there's a lot of material there that it needs its own video. <laughs> so first up is George. Peter said that everywhere they went, people kept asking them, the Beatles that is, when they were going to get back together. All of the ex-Beatles hated the question. I must admit that I kept hoping the Beatles would get back together until the time it was no longer possible. They knew that if you said never, it would make you a bad guy, so Paul, George, Ringo, they kept avoiding a negative answer. And John's response was, when you go back to high school. So leave it to John to come up with that one. <laughs> Peter thought the end of the Beatles would be a benefit for George. He had always complained about John and Paul keeping him down. And then George went into the studio with Phil Spector and spent six months making All Things Must Pass. It was a three-record set, and it was released just before Christmas of 1970 for $13.98. That was retail price, which is kind of high at that time. The album came out number one in America and England. Even though everyone was giving the album high praise, George wasn't any happier than John, Paul, or Ringo. It seemed to make him moodier and turn inward spiritually, and he turned away from friends. He spent several days sitting on a mountaintop in Cornwall, searching for the truth. In 1970, he bought Friar Park for $300,000. It was in disrepair, and it would cost George hundreds of thousands of dollars to get back to normal. This place had George on a spiritual path. He supported the growing Krishna movements around the world, and he hooked up with a guru, uh, a swami who was 77 years old. He was the spiritual leader of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. He invited the guru and some monks to live in one of the smaller houses on the grounds of Friar Park. And George would get up at dawn and bathe in cold water and study the Bhagavad Gita, and he became more and more involved with the gardens at Friar Park. He spent hours walking through them. George became a stern lecturer to those he considered less enlightened than he was. He talked about karma and life metaphors, to the, and then he would talk about plants. And he stated that being a rock star millionaire, confronted with the luxuries of the material world, when the spiritual one was the only one that really mattered. And George's friends began to call him his lectureship behind his back. It began to make him, as Peter put it, a big bore. Patty Harrison was miserable. They had been married six years, and she felt unfulfilled and stifled. She was just 26 years old, and she was forbidden to have a career of her own, and she was isolated in the big gloomy house. She wanted very much to raise a family, but never seemed to get pregnant. George was a little embarrassed that he was the only Beatle who wasn't a father at that time. George took the blame, but it was Patty who was unable to have children. Patty was willing to adopt kids, but George refused. They had arguments over it, and Patty would go away on London for overnight trips. Patty had an ally with Eric Clapton, and anyone who saw Eric and Patty together knew that Eric was in love with her, and even George realized it. Patty was unhappy with George, and she encouraged Eric's attention, and Patty started to manipulate Clapton to get George mad. Clapton later said, She used me, you see, and I fell madly in love with her. The three of them would hang out together, and that wasn't a good idea. And the worst night was the opening night of Old Calcutta. Peter Brown took Patty to the show, and after the show, Stigwood threw a party and George, he was finishing work in the studio in the early hours of the morning, and he went to join Patty and Peter. He was tired from working, and he just wanted to take Patty home with him. He searched all over for her, but he couldn't find her. Peter didn't know where she was, but said he had last seen her with Eric Clapton. George was angry that they had been alone together so long, and then George decided he was going to leave. He was halfway down the driveway when he saw Patty and Eric walking together, holding hands. George screeched his brakes and flew out of the car and started yelling, and he forbade Patty and Eric to see each other again, and he just about shoved Patty into the car. Eric was stressed out about his relationship with Patty and started taking heroin. 
he started a new relationship with a girl named Alice Ormsby Gore, and he wrote the song Layla about his feelings for Patty. George Harrison released Living in the Material World in the summer of 1973, and it wasn't very well received. The single Give Me Love placed the album on the top of the charts, but the album was long and repetitive and went on about God, Krishna, and the Hindu religion. The lyrics were preachy and boring, according to Peter. Georgia put all his eggs in one basket with all things must pass. Georgia's marriage was coming to an end. George had been cheating on Patty a lot. He wanted to seduce every woman he laid eyes on. George ended up having a fling with Ringo's wife, Maureen. One night, Maureen and Ringo invited George and Patty to join them for dinner. They had dinner and a lot of wine, and George was strumming the guitar and singing love songs. He put down his gu guitar suddenly, and he said he was in love with Maureen. Everyone was speechless, and Maureen turned bright red, and Ringo stormed off, and Patty burst into tears. A few weeks later, Patty returned home to Friar Park after shopping in London and found George in bed with Maureen. When asked why he chose his buddy's wife, George just answered, incest. So Patty started to lead an independent life. She went back to her career, which George didn't want her to do, and she had an extramarital affair with Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones. And then one day she packed and left Friar Park while George was in London. She said she was taking a vacation, and George never questioned it. Patty went to live with her sister in Los Angeles, and Eric Clapton was living in Miami at this time, getting over his heroin addiction. He went clean in 1973, and Patty joined him on the road, and they got married on March 27, 1979. After Patty moved out, George started seeing a 24-year-old girl named Kathy Simmons, and George began drinking more, and he became more religious. In 1974, he released Dark Horse and began a 27-city tour in North America. The album and tour was disastrous. He had Ravi Shankar with 24 Indian musicians doing an hour of esoteric Indian music. The audience politely were restless at the first, and then they got resentful. And when George took to the stage, he tried to get the audience to chant mantras and sing Hare Krishna, and when they didn't respond with gusto, he lectured them. Then, in 1977, George got sued for plagiarism when his song, My Sweet Lord, sounded too much like He's So Fine by the Chiffons. George took his guitar to court to demonstrate to the judge how he had composed the song. They found George guilty of unconscious plagiarism, and George had to pay $587,000 in damages to Bright Tunes. In the meantime... Alan Klein, of all people, had bought the company Bright Tunes, well, their catalog, and the money ended up in his company. Uh, George often visited the AMM Records before his legal run-in with the company, and it was there that he met Olivia Trinidad Arias. George's relationship with her was the first time he was in love and not infatuated. Olivia moved into a rented house in Beverly Hills with George, and they traveled to Hawaii and London. They lived together for four years, and then Olivia gave birth to a son they named Danny, August the 1st, 1978. George and Olivia married a month later in a quiet ceremony at Friar Park. No one got to know much about Olivia. George kept her out of his celebrity life. They were to lead a quiet life at Friar Park just the way George wanted it. He had plenty of time to spend with Danny and work in the garden. Peter said George didn't seem too content even with all of that. He felt he was in the shadow of the four mop tops and they were hanging over everything he did. The last time Peter saw him at Friar Park, George talked about karma and gardening and would talk those subjects as long as someone listened to him. Peter said that George had a love for racing cars and he was the third richest of the Beatles and became a shrewd investor in motion pictures. In 1981, George published an expensive leather-bound edition of his autobiography, and the book was ghostwritten by Derek Taylor. Now we come to Ringo. Out of the Beatles, Ringo was a millionaire in his own right, but he was the poorest of them. He was a man of expensive taste. His first two albums, which was his major source of revenue, weren't really successful. The three other Beatles helped him to record an album, and Ringo became the most popular album of the year. He had three hit singles in it, and Photograph and Year 16, uh, be, there were the two number ones he had from the album. 
The success of the album Surprise Ringo and the other Beatles were a little jealous. And John, half kidding, wrote to Ringo a telegram that said, How dare you? Why don't you write me a hit song? <laughs> and then Ringo started to put out an album a year. They didn't have much going for them except that he was an ex Beatle. And Ringo invested in a furniture design company with Robin Cruikshank called Ringo or Robin Limited. And they had items like a Rolls Royce grill table or a chrome plated circular fireplaces. The company didn't make it. Ringo acted in a few bit parts in films like That'll Be the Day and Sextet, a movie with Mae West. He had some warm reviews, but he wasn't really an actor. He was a celebrity and a wealthy man, but he didn't have a daily purpose in life. He thought he was a ladies' man, and he divorced Maureen in 1975. She was heartbroken. She loved him even after her fling with George, and she waited on Ringo, was his friend, and soothed him when he was tired and cranky. And she looked the other way when he strayed with other women, but she couldn't hold on to him. Ringo made Maureen a wealthy woman with the terms of their divorce settlement, and she was given a cash settlement of 500,000 pounds with more to come as needed over the years. Maureen still pined for him and, like Cynthia, hoped that they could get back together one day. And that was according to Peter Brown when the book came out in 1983. Ringo gave up his English residency because of the tax laws and became a tax exile. He bought a lavish condo in the luxury building on the side of a cliff in Monte Carlo. He took up residency there. He was a man without a country or a home. Ringo liked to live the fast lane. He, he liked beautiful young women, and he took up with an American model named Nancy Andrews for a time. He gambled heavily in Monte Carlo's Lowe's Casino and jumped from continent to continent whenever he felt like it. Ringo said he was on planes half the year going places, and wherever he went, it was a swinging place, man. Nancy Andrews got tired of the fast living and went back to Los Angeles. She then took him to court for palimony for $7 million. So Ringo bought homes in Amsterdam and Los Angeles, and he partied in Los Angeles with uh, Keith Moon and Harry Nielsen. Ringo also spent time with Mal Evans, the Beatles' road manager. When the Beatles disbanded, Mal didn't know what to do with himself. He became an ordinary man again. He got bored with his wife and kids and left England and moved to Los Angeles in the early 1970s. By 1976, he was living in an apartment complex in West Hollywood with some young girl drinking and drugging heavily, seeing Ringo or John or one of the guys when they passed through town. Ma was so big, he thought he needed twice as much food, twice as much booze, and twice as many drugs. And one night, he took downers. They made him angry, and he got into a bad fight with his girlfriend. Allegedly, he pulled a gun on her, and she called the police. The police came and Maul went and opened the door and the police then broke the door down and Maul was standing there with a gun and they opened fire on him and he died instantly. It was sad when he died he was cremated and his ashes were lost in the mail. When John heard the story he said that Maul had wound up in the dead letter department. So Ringo's fast living caught up with him and in late April 1979 he was rushed to Monte Carlo Hospital in critical condition. They were forced to remove part of his intestines. When he recovered, he went back to partying like nothing had happened. In 1980, Ringo made a movie called Caveman, and he got glowing reviews, and it was there that he met Barbara Bach. She was divorced with children, and she was a dedicated mother. After a month of dating, Ringo took her to London to meet his children, and Maureen wasn't too happy about that. And Ringo and Barbara married in London at the Melbourne Registry, April 27, 1981. Paul and George attended the ceremony with their wives, and John was the only one missing. Now we come to Paul. Paul at this time was going through a rough time. People were blaming him and Yoko about breaking up the Beatles. Regarding his career, he felt like he was either going to go under or he was going to get something together. Even when Paul was with the Beatles, he had wanted to start over and get back to his audience in just a little rock band again, and this was the perfect time to do it. He formed Wings, and he hired unknown musicians to pay them small salaries. Paul got Linda in the band because if Yoko and John could do it, he could do it with Linda. The only thing was Yoko had some musical ability, but Linda was a photographer. Paul wanted her in his professional life. The critics were mean to Paul, and Linda got criticism too. They said she was a minimal piano player, her vocals were worse, and she was criticized 
for her appearance and the clothes she wore. February of 1972, Paul and his band went out to the English countryside in a van, and they would turn up at administration offices of Nottingham University, and Paul asked if he could set up his equipment and give a free concert for the students. He requested the students not be told, nor the press. February the 8th, Paul gave a surprise concert for 700 happy students. It had been eight years since the Beatles' first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Paul loved it. He loved a live audience. Paul and Wings spent the following summer and fall touring around England and Europe in a double-decker bus painted with rainbows and clouds. They ate their meals on the road that was only bread and cheese and wine. They also traveled with marijuana. It was their favorite recreational drug. Paul and Linda had to travel around with it because they didn't have Neil or Maul with them anymore, and sometimes they would have friends mail them uh, marijuana in various hotels around Europe throughout the summer. The McCartney's luck ran out when they were in Gothenburg, Sweden. August the 10th, the local police and customs officials had intercepted a reported half pound of grass that had been mailed to them from London. Paul, Linda, and Denny had been taken to the police station and questioned for several hours. They confessed to smoking pot and were fined 800 pounds. It was bad luck at that time that Paul's next song was called Hi, 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 <laughs> but he spelled it H-I, and it was thought to be a drug reference. The song was banned by BBC, and it was a failure in America. A few months later, a local constable in Scotland was snooping around Paul's farm, and Paul wasn't there, and the constable found marijuana growing in the greenhouse. The courts only fined him 100 pounds. Paul said that an American fan had sent him seeds, and he didn't know what they were when he planted them. <laughs> Even I find that story hard to believe. <laughs> so Paul's next album was Red Rose Speedway, and it was a million-selling commercial hit. My Love was one of the songs on the album, and Paul also created the James Bond song Live and Let Die. It was one of the biggest singles of the year and got an Oscar nomination for Best Song. Paul and his band were rehearsing and composing for Wing's next album, which was to be recorded in Nigeria. And one day during rehearsals, Paul wanted Henry McCulloch to play the guitar, uh, the guitar part a certain way, that he wanted it, and Henry said that it couldn't be played the way Paul wanted it. Paul, being a guitarist too, knew that it could be played, and he confronted Henry, and they had a confrontation. Henry got mad, and he left, and then he called to say that he was leaving the band. During this time, Denny Sewell called Paul just hours before they were supposed to leave the country to say that he couldn't face playing with him any longer. Paul decided to go to Lagos anyway. Denny Lane went there with Paul, Linda, and the kids. Lagos was a nightmare, and Paul and Linda were in danger from criminals that stole their wallets and jewelry. And Linda kept screaming, Don't hurt him. He's Beetle Paul. He's Beetle Paul. And the authorities said it was a fortunate thing that Linda had done that. Otherwise, they would have been killed. The album they made was Band on the Run, and it was released December 1973. It sold 6 million copies, the highest amount of any ex-Beetle, and an amount equaling the group's biggest success, Let It Be. Paul then hired a new drummer named Jeff Britton and a new guitarist, Jimmy McCulloch. The summer of 1974, they went to Nashville to record singles. Then they went to New Orleans in January and February of 1975, where they recorded the album Venus and Mars, and it was another best-selling album. Paul and Linda and the kids were in Los Angeles when Paul called Peter Brown and said that he wanted to visit Peter's room. Paul was pale as a ghost and upset. He and Linda and the kids were driving along Sunset Boulevard in their rental car when they went through a red light. The policeman pulled them over and they could smell marijuana and they found some in the glove compartment. Linda took the blame and said it was the grass was hers. She got arrested and taken in. Paul didn't have the money to get her out and neither did Peter. Finally, Peter got money from a friend and Paul got Linda out of jail. John Eastman flew out there to handle the case, and the judge at first said Linda should see a psychiatrist for drug rehabilitation, but the case was later dismissed. With all that stress, you would think that Linda and Paul would be more careful, but when they went to Japan in 1980, it was for the first wings tour there, they found nearly a half pound of marijuana in their luggage when they were at the airport. Paul was handcuffed and led away by the police. Paul's clothes and belongings were taken from him, and he spent his days sitting on a mat in a prison cell, writing a diary to keep him calm. 
Linda and the kids checked into a hotel, and Paul spent 10 days in jail. He was deported from the country on January 26th. He intended to publish his diary entitled Japanese Jailbird, but thought the better of it. It was said that Paul was at the end of his rope with Linda at this time and that the marriage was going to split up, but the relationship was stronger than ever. Paul tried to keep in touch with John, but there was never a renewal of their friendship. As time passed and lawsuits uh, settled down, John and Paul would visit each other from time to time in Los Angeles and New York, and it was never more than an hour or two. Paul spent most of his time at home with Linda and his three young children, he was a caring and attentive father and close to his young son, James. Heather, by that time, was a young woman living on her own in an apartment in a nearby town, and she brought her boyfriend home to meet her dad. Uh, the boyfriend was in a band, and the young man was nervous, and Paul was charming and said, What's your band called, son? When Peter visited Paul, Double Fantasy was about to be released. It was his first record in five years. Paul was curious to hear it, and Linda asked if the new album was all of John's music, or did it have her on it too? When Peter said it was half Yoko's music, Linda sneered at the thought. So I'm going to end with Paul on this video, and I will conclude the Peter Brown book in the next episode where he talks about John Lennon. Well, I didn't know that Ringo was such a jet setter and a party man, but he paid the price for it by having half his intestines taken out. It didn't stop him, though, from getting right back to where he left off when he got well again. Ringo got divorced, but he found love again with Barbara Bach. Maureen, Ringo's ex-wife, felt just like Cynthia had about John. She kept hoping that her and Ringo could get back together again one day. Paul got back to the road and started all over with a new band, and this band showed that he could be just as successful as he was with the Beatles. Paul went through some stressful moments with his marijuana troubles, but he could have had avoided it by not taking the marijuana with him wherever he went. Paul wanted to maintain his friendship with John, but at that time, John wasn't feeling it. He was in his own little drug bubble and raising his son. So the next episode will definitely have us coming to a close on the series, and it's been an adventure. We're going to find out next what happened to John during this time, so it should be very interesting as the whole book has been. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated. And tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you.